שעבר. building up its strength. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Evgeny Berzak. Um, his work uh, lies at the intersection of uh, natural language processing, uh, linguistics, and human cognition. Uh, I always believe that uh, great progress in our field uh, will only come when we work uh, across discipline boundaries. 
And one of the reasons Evgeny's work is so successful um, because he's doing just that. Evgeny, go ahead. Thank you. So English is the most used language on the internet, and it has over 1.5 billion speakers worldwide. But there is something very interesting about the distribution of these speakers. It turns out that most of them learned English as a second language. Now this is something that is not reflected in the scope of scientific work, linguistic resources, and natural language processing tools that are developed for English. So in this thesis, we're going to advocate for this underrepresented majority of non-native speakers and ask how do people learn a second language? Unfortunately, it will take more than one PhD to answer this question, but we will make progress on a more specific yet important question, which is what is the role of the native language in second language learning? This question is what linguists typically refer to as cross-linguistic transfer. And it's perhaps easiest to demonstrate it in production, so I'd like to show you a few sentences from an ESL essay that is English as Second Language essay that were written by a native speaker of Russian. We can read out the first sentence, and your ad was said that in main role would be Danny Brook. This sounds weird, right? So if you look at the sentence and the remaining sentences in this example, this, would is, this is not what you would call proper English. But if we take these sentences and direct translate them word by word into Russian, they sound perfect. And this exemplifies this process of cross-linguistic transfer where we have structure and knowledge of the native language, which is applied in the context of a newly learned foreign language. And this can happen on various levels of linguistic performance, and I'm sure that you're all familiar with this, either firsthand or by interacting with English learners. So in this thesis, we're going to study this question of cross-linguistic transfer, but before I get into the details, I would like to summarize three high-level contributions of the thesis. So first of all, the topic of cross-linguistic transfer is traditionally studied in second language acquisition and in linguistics. Here we're going to connect linguistic theory with linguistic resources and computational modeling tools from NLP and broad coverage behavioral analysis from psycholinguistics. And combining these three things together will enable us to study cross-linguistic transfer both in production and in comprehension within one unified framework. Finally, this approach will allow us to connect between two different fields of study. The first is second language learning, which deals with how people acquire new languages. And the second is linguistic typology, which deals with linguistic characterization of languages and identification of regularities across languages. Traditionally, these topics are studied in separation. What we show in this thesis is that we can leverage the process of cross-linguistic transfer in order to make inferences from one domain to the other. So we can start with linguistic performance and language processing in a second language and use this information to infer typological properties of the native language, but we can also do inferences in the opposite direction. We can start with native language typology and then predict how second language learning will look like. All right, so this is the outline of the talk. I'll start by discussing cross-linguistic transfer in language production. And here we'll see how to reconstruct native language typology from second language usage. And then we'll look at the opposite direction, predicting grammatical errors in ESL from the typology of the native language. Then we'll, we'll discuss cross-linguistic transfer in comprehension. And here we'll see that it's possible to infer the first language of ESL learners from the way that they read in English. Next, I'll discuss new resources that we developed in this thesis. In particular, I will describe the tree bank of learner English, which is the first syntactic tree bank for ESL. And finally, there will be a conclusion. All right, so we've seen this word-to-word -word translation from Russian to English. Now we're going to abstract away from this word-to-word -word translation and focus on the structural properties of the native language which in general we refer to as typological features. Some examples of such features are word order, does the language have definite or indefinite articles, how do you form negation, and so forth. And what we'll see is how to reverse engineer this impact of native language typology on second language usage by starting with morphosyntactic features in ESL and using them to infer back the typological properties of the native language. We'll do this in two steps. First, we'll see how to take a bunch of unannotated essays in ESL and use them to infer an approximation for the typological similarity structure between languages. Then we'll take this one step further and use this similarity structure in order to predict specific typological properties of languages, 
And the interesting part about this will be that we will predict these typological properties without having any a priori knowledge about the target language. We will use a corpus which is called the FCE. It is the publicly available subset of the Cambridge Learner Corpus. It has intermediate proficiency learners from 14 different native languages and about 88 documents per language. Now given this corpus, we're going to extract features. If we have a sentence like, I was champion of swimming competition in Russia, we're actually going to ignore the words in the sentence and instead we'll focus on the syntactic categories and the relations between them. And this is information that we can obtain from an off-the-shelf English parser. So more specifically, the kind of features that we'll be using will be dependency triplets. So this will be the part of speech tag of the head word, the dependency relation, and then the part of speech tag of the dependent. We'll look at the ordering between the head and the dependent, the distance between them, other part of speech tags that occur between the head and the dependent, and then sequences of part of speech tags and morphological affixation. So what's common to all these features is that they're relevant to structural use in English as a second language. All right, so we have our corpus and we extracted structural features. Now we're going to feed these features into a model of native language identification. So this is a log linear classifier that gives a probability of native language Y given ESL document X and the model parameters theta that we can learn with gradient descent. So now we can take a document that say was written by a native speaker of Russian, we feed it to the classifier and the classifier will give us probabilities for the different classes. So this is the point where normally in NLP we declare victory by just reporting the class with the highest probability. And this is the task that people call native language identification. Here we're going to do something different. So instead of looking at one document by a native speaker of Russian, we'll now consider all the documents that we have by native speakers of Russian, and then we'll look at the probabilities that the classifier is giving to all the other classes. We will average these probabilities and put them in a matrix where each cell in this matrix tells us the extent that the classifier can tell apart this pair of languages. So in this particular matrix, it's more difficult for the classifier to distinguish between Russian and Polish than Russian and Japanese. Now when two things are difficult to tell apart from each other, it means that they're similar to one another. So we can think of this matrix as a similarity matrix between our languages with respect to how native speakers of these languages are using English as a second language. All right, we extracted these ESL-based similarities and now we want to compare them to the actual linguistic similarities of our languages. And this is information that we can obtain from the VARS database, the World Atlas of Language Structures. So this is the repository where linguists manually document properties of different languages. On this slide, you can see a few more examples of such properties that are related to word order. And now in order to obtain similarity between two languages, we will binarize and vectorize the VALS features and then take the cosine similarity between the respective vectors. So this is straightforward. The only complication is that the documentation in VALS is quite partial. So even for our set of languages, which are very well studied, we have on average only 114 features that are available out of possible 151. And in order to address this issue, whenever we take a cosine similarity between a, language, between a pair of languages, we'll consider only the features that are shared for these two languages. All right, so we have our independent similarity matrix, one from the linguistic properties of the languages and the other from ESL usage. So on the x-axis, we have the VAS-based similarities. On the y-axis, we have the ESL-based similarities. And we can see that there is a strong correlation between these similarity metrics. We can take this even one step further and use these pairwise similarities as an input to a hierarchical clustering algorithm. So on the left, you see the resulting linguistic tree. And on the right, you have the resulting ESL tree. And there are some interesting similarities between these two trees. For example, in both trees, we have the Indo-European languages separated from the non-Indo-European languages. We have a separate cluster for the Romance languages, Slavic languages, and so forth. Now what is cool and important to bear in mind is that the tree on the right was obtained entirely from English without having access to any of these languages. What this means in practice is that we can use this tree as a good approximation for the actual linguistic similarities between our languages. 
So we've seen how to go from typological from uh, ESL essays to, a, to an approximation of the typological classification of our languages, and now we want to use this similarity tree in order to predict specific typological properties of languages. So before we do that, perhaps we should ask why would we want to predict typology in the first place? So the first reason is that typology is very important in linguistics. If you want to understand what is shared across languages and what is different between different languages, or if you want to study linguistic universals, one way to do this is through this kind of information. The second reason is that can, it can be useful for NLP applications like part of speech tagging or syntactic parsing, in particular for languages that don't have a lot of linguistic resources. As I mentioned before, unfortunately, the typological documentation that is currently available is very scarce. So if you think of VAS, which is by far the best typological resource that we have, and think of it as a table where the rows are languages and the columns are features, then only about 17% of this table have known values. And it's important to remember that obtaining the missing information is really difficult. It can require several years of work by highly trained linguists. So there is a lot of value into being able to do these kind of predictions automatically. So the way that we're going to predict typology is using k-nearest neighbors. So if our target language is Catalan, we'll project its features from the neighboring languages, Portuguese and Spanish. And this is the way that people have been predicting typology in NLP. But the drawback of previous approaches is that they needed a lot of a priori knowledge about all the languages, in particular about the target language. So typically you would train or construct this tree based on 90% of the available features, and then you'll be able to do predictions only for the remaining 10%. The cool thing about the ESL-based method is that it obtains comparable results, but without needing any a priori knowledge about the target language. And the reason is that we get the similarity tree directly from English. And so we can take a language that we know literally nothing about and still be able to position it in this tree. To give you a better intuition about the quality of these results, we can compare the performance of the supervised VAS method and the unsupervised ESL-based method as a function of the percentage of VAS features that we're using to construct the tree. And we see that the performance of VAS decreases the less features we're using. On the other hand, the ESL method is constant because it doesn't depend on these features at all. And the performance that we get is roughly equivalent to using about 40% of the typological information that we have in VAS, which is a very strong result. So to summarize this part, we've seen that it's possible to obtain a typological classification of languages directly from ESL text, and then to use this classification to recover individual typological features. And beyond the methodological contributions, there is also an interesting scientific point that we can make here, namely that the ability to do this inference tells us that there is empirical evidence for systematic nature of cross-linguistic transfer. All right, so we've seen how to go from ESL essays to prediction of typological properties. Now we want to look at the opposite direction. If we have the typology of the native language, can we say something about ESL usage? So specifically, we'll be looking at the question of grammatical errors, and our task will be to use typological properties to predict the global distribution of grammatical errors in ESL for different native languages. So why would we want to do that? The first reason is practical. This kind of information can be used for grammatical error correction tools. So it, you can just plug this kind of distribution as a prior to a, grammar uh, to a grammar correction tool, and this improves the performance of this kind of system. The second reason is theoretical, and it has to do with the formalization of a linguistic theory, which is called contrastive analysis. So this is a quote by Robert Lado, who is one of the people who proposed this approach. And he said that we can predict and describe the patterns that will cause difficulty in learning and those that will not cause difficulty by comparing systematically the language to be learned with the language of the student. So these kind of ideas gave rise to a lot of work in ESL that tried to analyze errors in a second language in light of different properties of the first language. And even though there was a lot of work in this field around these ideas, there's actually no model that formalizes this notion and is able to, to do predictions for new data. And this is the point that we're going to address here. We're going to use the same corpus that we used before, the FCE, 
Only now we're going to take advantage of the error notation in this corpus. So it's a pretty elaborate error notation. It has 75 different error types on different uh, levels of granularity. And here you can see a few examples of these error types. So out of the 75 errors, we're going to focus only on the 20 most common errors. And now we're going to formalize this contrastive analysis-inspired framework, which takes the topology of the native language in conjunction with the typology of English and uses this information to predict grammatical errors in ESL. So specifically, we will have a regression model that predicts error frequencies of individual error types like missing determiners from the combination of the typological features of English and the native language. And we're going to predict these errors individually and then normalize them such that they sum to one. So to give you a few more details about the features, we can think about our feature set as divided into two groups. The first are the typological properties of the native language, and the second are our contrastive analysis features, which compare between uh, values of feature values of, of uh, between values of features from vals. So if we have a certain feature from vals, and there will be a different value in the native language and in English, then our feature will be one and zero otherwise. So now we can train this model with ordinary least squares and test it in a leave one out fashion, and these are the results that we obtain. So first of all, the base is our baseline, which is language independent. So here we just set the distribution of grammatical errors for a target language to be the average distribution in the training data. Then we have a simpler language specific model, which is the nearest neighbor model. And finally, we have our contrastive analysis-based regression model, which outperforms both of these baselines on most of the error types and most of the languages. So to give you a more qualitative impression for these results, these are some of the most common errors for native speakers of Japanese. And now in blue, you can see the predictions of the baseline model, which underestimates the frequency of missing determiners and overestimates the frequency of word order errors. On the other hand, our regression model correctly predicts missing determiners as the most frequent error for native speakers of Japanese, and we also get a good estimate for word order errors. Now, one of the nice properties of our model is that the features are very interpretable because they're all taken from VALS. So we can do basic feature analysis and see which features are most strongly associated with different types of grammatical errors. We can start with the case of missing determiners and here we see that the most predictive features for this error type are the lack of determiners in the native language. Conversely, decreased error rates for determiner omissions are associated with features that indicate the existence of a determiner system in the native language. So these are not shocking news, but it's a nice sanity check for the model to see that we're actually learning something that makes sense. Now we can look at a more interesting example of missing pronouns. And here the most predictive feature is pronominal subject affixes on verb. So it's not necessarily the lack of the relevant structure, but it can be the, the different encoding of the same structure in the native language that drives this kind of error. And conversely, decreased error rates for pronoun omission are associated with a pronoun system and person marking <coughs> system that is similar to the one in English. So this kind of analysis is of course preliminary, but it's a good tool for generating hypotheses that we can give to linguists to analyze further. So we've shown a predictive and explanatory model for contrastive analysis, and the cool aspect about this model is that you can make predictions for a new language without actually having any ESL data for this language. So you don't even need text. All right, so we have this model that predicts grammatical error distributions from typological features. Now, if you want to apply it in a real world scenario, the situation will be that you probably won't have enough VALS features. So as I mentioned before, typological databases are not well documented. So it would be nice if you would have a method for obtaining these missing features in an automatic manner. Now, luckily that's exactly what we did in the first part of the talk. So now we can combine these two components into one bootstrapping strategy. So we can start with unannotated essays in ESL, use them to infer the typology of the native language, and then use this predicted typology in order to predict the grammatical error distribution in English. 
When we do this, these are the results that we obtain. They're not as strong as using the actual typology of our languages, and this makes sense because the data is noisy now, but we still get improvements over the baseline on most of the languages and most of the error types. So to summarize the part on production, we've seen that it's possible to obtain a typological classification of languages directly from ESL and then use this classification to predict specific typological features. Then we analyzed the opposite direction seen and seen that it's possible to predict grammatical errors in ESL from the typology of the native language. So now we'll discuss cross-linguistic transfer in language comprehension. And to get things started, let's take a few seconds and read the sentence on the screen. So I hope everybody got it. Now please raise your hand if English is not your first language. All right, so this is pretty much like the distribution that I showed on my first slide. So to those of you who raised their hand, it turns out that it's possible to predict what is your first language just from the way that your eyes are moving while you're reading that sentence in English. We can do that because language learners have a special pair of glasses, which we can call native language glasses, to which they read and comprehend other languages. And this brings us back to our topic of cross-linguistic transfer. We've seen a few results in language production. It turns out that we know very little about the role of the first language in second language comprehension. So in this work, we're going to propose eye tracking while reading freeform text in a second language as a general methodology for studying cross-linguistic transfer in language comprehension. This is our experiment. You start by looking at a fixation point for 300 milliseconds. That triggers a sentence. You read the sentence, and when you're done reading, you press on a button. Then you look at the letter Q for 300 milliseconds. That triggers a question about the sentence that you just read. You answer the question with a yes or a no, and then we let you know if you answered correctly. So you do this for 156 times, and then you're done. So it's a pretty boring experiment. And what makes it even more boring th is that all the sentences are the from the Wall Street Journal. So as a side note, we actually had several people that literally fell asleep during the experiment. So we have four different native languages, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, and Spanish, with about 36 to 37 participants for each language. The sentences that each participant is reading are divided into two groups. So half of the sentences are what we call shared sentences, where all the readers read the same set of sentences. And then the other half are individual sentences. So in this regime, we have different people reading different sentences. Let's start with the shared regime where everybody is reading the same set of sentences. We have our sentence. Now what we want to do now is to extract a set of simple, interpretable, and most importantly, robust features that will characterize the way that people are scanning these sentences. So in order to do that, we will first divide the sentence into interest regions that span individual words, and then we'll look at the distribution of fixations across these words. So concretely, we will be looking at three standard fixation metrics, total fixation duration, first pass fixation duration, and first fixation duration. And then in order to extract the actual feature, we will normalize these fixation times by the fixation metric per word in the sentence. In this regime where everybody is reading the same sentences, this just amounts to the fraction of time that you spend on each word. The reason that we do this normalization is that it gives us invariance to the reading speed of the participant. And this is something that can be very important for this kind of task. So now we're going to take these features and feed them into a log linear classifier. So it's the same classifier that we used before. And these are the results that we obtained. First of all, we have a majority baseline, which is slightly about 25%. And now we see that our speed invariant features substantially outperform this baseline. You can get even further performance improvements by considering not only individual words, but also spans of bigrams and trigrams. And what this result tells us is that there is a strong first language signal in second language reading. So, so far we've been looking at the shared regime where everybody were reading the same sentences. This is a very powerful setup because you can do comparisons of reading times in fixed context. So the classifier can focus only on the differences between different readers. But the setup also has a major limitation, namely that we're restricted to that specific set of sentences. 
So now we want to generalize this task of native language identification from reading to a setup where we have arbitrary sentences, both in training and in testing, and we can do that with the individual regime where different readers have different sentences. So this is a much more challenging situation because the reading times are no longer comparable, right? Different people read different sentences. It's not really clear what to compare and how. So in order to address this challenge, the first thing that we're going to do is a different type of normalization. So we now we will have our fixation metric and we'll normalize it by the fixation metric per word across all the sentences that the participant is given. Then we're going to cluster the words by some kind of predefined <coughs> linguistic criteria. And finally, in order to obtain the feature set, we will average the fixation times within each cluster. So how should we cluster the words? The first method that we, that we propose is to use word length. And word length is an interesting clustering criteria because it approximates average information content. So this is the average predictability of the word across different contexts. So now we can substitute our lexical items with their length and the features that we will have will be average fixation times on words of length three, length four, length five, and so forth. An alternative to this clustering strategy will be using syntactic clusters. So the downside, uh, downside, downside, <laughs> sorry, downside of using the Wall Street Journal is that it's boring to read, but the upside is that we have syntactic information for these sentences. And so now we can replace our words with the respective part of speech tags or with their syntactic functions, which are the labels to the head words. So let's see how well this works. First of all, again, we have our majority baseline, which is above, which is around 25%, and it turns out that if you cluster words uh, randomly, then you get performance that's very similar to this majority slash random baseline. However, when you use our information clusters, you get a much better performance. You get an even better performance than that which with the syntactic clusters, and finally, the best result is obtained by combining these two sources of information. So this is a really strong result because it lets us generalize this task of native language identification to completely arbitrary sentences. So we can have a new person, give them some sentences to read, and we don't need any eye tracking data for the specific sentences that we gave them. So we've seen that it works, and now we want to understand a little bit better why it works. We can start by doing an analysis that is similar to what we've seen in production by comparing this, the linguistic similarities of our languages to the uncertainty of the classifier. And uh, here again, we see that these two measures correlate. This result is much more preliminary because we only have four languages, but it's still nice to see that things align in this way. And now we can feed these pairwise similarities to a hierarchical clustering algorithm as before. And on the left, you see the linguistic tree of our languages and on the right, the ESL reading tree. And the, the ESL tree really reconstructs the linguistic tree and it's cool because we got this tree again without any knowledge of these languages just from the way that people were reading ESL text. So now we want to dive a little bit deeper and look at specific features that differ between different languages. So we can start with the case of determiners. We have our four native languages, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, and Spanish. And as a baseline, we also have native English speakers. So if we look at Chinese and Japanese, which are languages that don't have determiners, the question is now whether they will have shorter, the same, or longer reading times on this structure compared to native English speakers. And this may seem like a simple question, but actually up until this study, we didn't have an answer for it. It turns out that native speakers of Chinese and Japanese have shorter reading times on determiners compared to native English speakers. And when we look at Portuguese and Spanish, which are languages that do have determiners, we see that they have reading times that are comparable to those of native English speakers. We can see a similar trend with pronouns where Chinese and Japanese, which are languages that allow pronoun omission, have shorter reading times on, on pronouns compared to native English speakers. And to some extent, this also holds for Portuguese and Spanish, which allow pronoun omission in the subject position. Now we can see in another case, and this will be the case of nouns. Here, something very interesting is happening. It's actually the opposite of what we've seen with determiners and pronouns. So on nouns, Ch native speakers of Chinese and Japanese have longer fixation times compared to native speakers of English, 
while uh, for Portuguese and Spanish, this doesn't seem to be the case. And this brings up another possible factor that could be driving the reading times that we observe in a second language, which is the lexicon. So one possible explanation for this pattern is that Chinese and Japanese have much less lexical sharing with English compared to Portuguese and Spanish. So if you look at all of these three examples together, determiners, pronouns, and nouns, we can see that we have both structural and lexical factors that could be driving the reading times that we observe in English. So to summarize the part on comprehension, we've seen that it's possible to predict the native language of ESL learners from the way that they read in English. And then we've seen the differences in reading are very likely to be related to linguistic factors. So first of all, ESL preserves global similarities across native languages. And secondly, distinctive features in reading reflect different properties of those native languages. And taken together, we can think of these results as evidence for systematic cross-linguistic transfer in second language comprehension. So this parallels and extends the results that we've seen in production. So next, I would like to talk about new resources that we developed in the scope of this PhD. In order to advance research on second language acquisition, it's really important to have linguistically annotated resources. And you may be surprised to hear that, but up until a year ago, there was no publicly available syntactic tree bank for English as a second language. So we decided to step in and to create one, and this resource is called the Tree Bank of Learner English. It is annotated in a formalism which is called universal dependencies, where the main idea behind, behind this formalism is to have cross-linguistic consistency of annotations. So we annotate different languages within the same framework and the same formalism. Concretely, we annotated part of speech tags, both universal part of speech tags, a more traditional pen tree bank part of speech tags, as well as labeled dependency trees. We created annotations for over 5,000 sentences, which correspond to almost 100,000 words. And all the sentences are taken from the FCE, which is the corpus that I presented before. As I, as I previously mentioned, this corpus also has pre-existing error notation, and we can use this error notation in order to generate error-corrected versions for our sentences. So now we annotate both the original sentence and the error-corrected version of the sentence, and we do this for all the sentences. This creates a parallel corpus that we can use for different natural language processing applications, like grammatical error correction, which uses syntactic information. Perhaps the most exciting part about this tree bank is that we have 10 different native languages. And this corresponds to roughly 40% of the world's population. So if you take this property and you combine it with UD's cross-linguistic consistency of annotations, things become very interesting. Because now we can compare ESL not only to native English, but also to each and one of these languages. And this opens a lot of possibilities for new types of research in linguistics, but also new types of NLP applications, like multilingual syntactic parsing for ESL, or even more powerful models for grammatical error correction where you condition not only on the syntax of the sentence, but also on the native language of the writer. The tree bank is publicly available and we have a query engine that is online at esltreebank.org. So if you're interested in second language acquisition and its interface with syntax, I encourage you to take a look. All right, so it's time to conclude. First, I would like to recap the results. We've seen that it's possible to go from typology to ESL and from ESL to typology in language production. And then we introduced eye tracking with freeform text as a general framework for studying cross-linguistic transfer in language comprehension. In particular, we showed that it's possible to predict the first language of second language readers from the way that they read in English. Finally, we introduced the tree bank of learner English as a syntactic resource for multilingual analysis for ESL. So I'd like to conclude by going back to the high-level contribution of the thesis. So first of all, I hope that I convinced you that it's a good idea to combine linguistics with NLP and psycholinguistics into one framework, and then use this framework to study both language production and language comprehension. So here we've done it for the question of cross-linguistic transfer, but this kind of approach can be exp ex expanded to other aspects of language learning as well. Finally, we've taken the first steps in connecting between second language learning and native language typology, and I think that this direction is really worth exploring further as a way of getting better understanding of the cognitive representations and learning mechanisms that underlie multilingualism. And with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you.
Um, so perhaps while people are thinking about questions, I'll take a few a few minutes to to say thank you to some people. So when I sent out the the abstract of the thesis and I was when I was practicing the talk, <laughs> several people pointed out that I keep using the word we. And there is really a good reason for that, and that this work wouldn't have been possible uh, without the help of a lot of wonderful people, so I, I would like to thank them. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank my advisor, Boris, who's been a, a really terrific mentor. And I think that everybody who knows Boris also knows how kind and supportive and enthusiastic he is about research. And Boris gave me pretty much complete freedom to pursue ideas that I was really passionate about, and I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity. Next, I would like to thank my thesis committee, Peter Solowitz and Anna Koonen. Both of them were involved in my research from pretty early on, so Peter was on my RQE committee, and I collaborated with Anna on several projects and had the opportunity to visit her group in Cambridge. So it's a great pleasure and honor to have both of them on my committee. Next, I'd like to thank my collaborators. I was extremely lucky to have met these people and to have had the opportunity to work with them. If you look at the web pages uh, of this group of people, you'll see that they come from very different backgrounds and very different fields of expertise, starting from computer vision, NLP, second language acquisition, and psycholinguistics. And it was just a lot of fun to be able to explore all these areas and learn from their expertise. So I'm very, very thankful to all of them. Special thanks go to the team that actually annotated the Tree Bank of Learner English. Each one of them put about five to seven hundred hours of work into this resource. I have no idea how I convinced them to do it, but it's happened, and uh, I'm very, very grateful to all of them. Finally, I would like to thank my group, InfoLab. Uh, you guys are all awesome, whoever is here. And I'll leave you with a quote from a book that I really like, which is called Cat's Cradle, and it's written by one of my favorite authors, Kurt Vonnegut. So if you didn't enjoy the talk, at least you can leave with a good book recommendation. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. We didn't include them in the experiment. Sorry? We didn't include them in, in the experiment. Did you? We, we didn't have those. We, those yeah. Okay. But it would be it would be interesting to to study bilingualism as well as in growing up with with two different languages. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, we didn't evaluate the performance of the parser, but it seemed to be good enough, uh, or there was enough signal for what we were we were interested in. Uh, but it's definitely an issue in terms of just running an off-the-shelf parser and, and hoping for the best. But that's pretty much the only option that we had, because at the time there was there, there were no other types of annotation. Those parsers are trained on Python. Native English, Python. yeah. It's a little bit more diverse these days, so it's not just uh, the Wall Street Journal, but it's still native English, so it's, uh, it's a different type of language. Yeah. And then a, a somewhat similar question is, uh, I did some work with eye tracking, which is not a language, but looking at uh, radiology images and trying to understand where people were looking in the image. And I was not super impressed with the accuracy of the eye tracking for two reasons, and I'm just wondering if Yeah, so first of all, we're using a state-of-the-art eye, eye tracker, the iLink 1000, and I spent about half a year of my life figuring out how to calibrate it properly, so hopefully the results are, like, it, it should be pretty accurate. 
uh, within 0 0.2 degrees of error. But in, in general, I think it's, it's something that, that might be interesting to look at the, the effects of the orthography. I think that I think that you would. I, I think it says something fundamental about how we acquire and process language. Um, and yes, we look at traces of performance in, in many ways in production. Um, but I think it does capture something fundamental about how the actual linguistic processing is happening. And I think it's um, it, it does get to the core questions about how language works. I don't know if it touches on the exact uh, concept that he introduced, but. Um, well, I don't pretend to have a good mental simulation of job description, <coughs> but uh, <coughs> <coughs> it seems to me that he, he has at various times uh, disdained worrying about performance issues, which I'm sensing that some of the ESL folks Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Nat the, the, the question of a native language, is, it's just part of the whole picture. And there, are, there is still the core question on, of how this happens that you, stat that you learn a second language. And there are a lot of commonalities across different native languages. And actually, one of the directions that I'm going to explore now is how to combine these kind of more native language specific aspects of language learning with more general mechanisms of, of learning and how they're manifested in writing or in reading. Um, so it's, it's definitely just part of the picture, but 
if you want to understand the whole process, so you need to understand that, and then also more more general things about how learning in the second language occurs. Yeah. Thank you. Sounds good. Yeah, so I'll be outside your office.